Hello, everybody. Um, right. So my name is uh, Meredith. Uh, I am uh, one of the, uh, the founders and co-creator of Anvil, which is a tool for building full stack web apps with nothing but Python. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about how that works underneath, uh, how the technical stuff works, and a little bit about why we built it the way we did. So, I mean, the first thing to say is if you're trying to make a better way to build web applications is, well, why do you need that? Like, the web app's so broken? And I'm going to argue yes. As a programming platform, the web has a lot of disadvantages. Uh, let's, let's start by thinking about it from the perspective of your data. If you're writing a traditional web application, your data probably starts at, oh, yeah, hello, get the focus right. There we go. Your data probably starts as rows in a database table accessed by SQL which is a very sensible way for data to be represented. Except you're going to turn around and immediately transform those into objects in your server-side code, probably Python objects in present company, uh, with methods and attributes uh, to access them. But of course, they're not going to stay like that. You're immediately going to turn around and re-represent those as JSON exposed over HTTP endpoints. Uh, with a huge number of endpoints and this weirdly limited set of verbs like get, post, put, delete, very different representation. But of course, on the other end of that HTTP request is going to be JavaScript, which is going to reassemble those into back into objects with a different set of methods and a different set of attributes. Uh, and you're not done because, of course, you're then going to transform that into uh, DOM objects that you're then going to have to style with CSS to reach the pixels on the screen and get to the user's eyeball. And that's a lot of different representations. And converting between them is most of the day-to-day -day work of web programming. And that work is tedious and repetitive. And that is why it invites all the wrong sorts of magic. And what do I mean by the wrong sorts of magic? Well, let me explain by taking a totally unfair pot shot at SQL Alchemy. Uh, so if you haven't used it, SQL Alchemy is a really neat library, which is why this is an unfair pot shot. It's a library that uh, helps you translate uh, rows from SQL database into Python objects. And it's really cool. It lets you write code like this. You know, query book, filter book dot price is less than 20. That's nice. Of course, the process that turns this Python expression into SQL you can execute against a database is black magic. We are talking meta classes. We are talking overriding Python operators to do something completely different to what they normally do. If you thought that less than sign was a simple numerical com uh, comparison, surprise! And if you try to use it as one, you will be surprised. And so it's, you know, you actually need to end up understanding quite a lot to use it deeply. And you, that's okay. You can get away with it if you do this once, maybe. But if you do this, something that with that much magic in it at every level of this stack, you are in for a bad day. And yet, of course, that's exactly what we do. We have ORMs like SQL Alchemy to helping us turn database rows into objects. We have REST frameworks helping us represent those objects as HTTP endpoints. We have JavaScript frameworks like Angular's resources helping us reassemble those objects back into JavaScript, or HTTP requests back into JavaScript objects. We have templating frameworks helping us turn those JavaScript objects into HTML DOM. We have CSS frameworks helping us turn those into pixels. And all of those have the wrong kind of magic. They all abuse the syntax of one layer to represent the semantics of another layer. And what that means is you actually, if you're, you're properly using, for example, something like SQL Alchemy, you need to understand how the Python works, how the SQL is working underneath, and how SQL Alchemy does that transformation in order to use it properly. So there's this explosion of complexity just to kind of cope with the complexity that we've already introduced to the system. Well, we're Pythonistas here. How does that stack up against the Zen of Python? Simple is better than complex. Who can look at that with a straight face and call it a simple system? Because I can't. If the implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea. I mean, how does the inside of React work? How does the inside of SQL Alchemy work? These are not, again, easy to explain systems. Oh, here's a famous one. There should be one and preferably only one way to do it. 
Oh boy! So, if the web is actually horrendously unpythonic and violates a bunch of values that we have for very good reasons, how could we do better? Well, Anvil is our attempt to answer that question. And the way we do this better is to do away by, with all of these translation layers by doing away with the translation, by, represent, by replacing all of these representations of your data with Python objects. What does this mean in practice? Well, we have a Python UI framework uh, that uh, drives a user interface element on the screen as Python objects. Uh, you write, uh, with Anvil, you write your client-side code in Python. We compile it to JavaScript, it runs in the web browser, but that means that you drive your UI by interacting with Python objects from Python. Python on the server, of course, but if we've got Python on the server and Python on the client, well, we don't need to mash everything into JSON anymore. We can just make a function call. We even have a uh, Python native database. It is backed by Postgres, but the interface it presents is all Python objects. And so you get this one representation from top to tail. Okay, that's the theory. Let me show you what that looks like in practice. So, uh, what I am showing you here uh, is the Anvil editor. So I'm just going to sign in anvil.works. I'm loading up the Anvil editor. I'm going to create a new application, choose the material design theme. And I'm just going to build like a hello world app that greets you by name. This is the uh, a web page. This is a toolbox of things you can put onto your web page. So if I want to put a title on my page, I just take a label, stick it up here in the title bar, and then I can edit its attributes. So I can say it's text should be hello world. Pretty simple, right? Okay, uh, let's uh, be a little bit more interactive. So we want to prompt the user to enter their name. So I've put a card on there. I'm going to add a label to that card to prompt the user to enter their name. Uh, I'm going to add a text box so that they can answer that question. Uh, I'm going to call it name box. Every uh, component in Anvil has a variable name so we can access it from code. I'm gonna have a button here uh, so they can click when they're done. Text on it should be, uh, should be say hello, maybe make it a bit more prominent. Uh, and you can see what's going to happen here, right? They've got a, they're going to enter their name, they're going to click a box and a message is going to appear underneath. So uh, the last thing we need here is a label. We're going to call that message label. And we can edit some more properties. So let's make text centered. Uh, we can make it big and so on. So I've just built a user interface and obviously that's a lot faster than it would have been with HTML and CSS. But the really cool thing is it's backed by Python. So if I select this button and go down and I look at its click event, this is the Python code that will run when I click that button. And you can see all the things I've dragged and dropped onto my page are, vari are available as variables in my Python code. So if I want to say, set the text on the message label based on what text has been put into the name box, I go self.messagelabel.text equals hello self dot name box dot text. And that's it. So if I run this, uh, hello conf. Right, just give it give it a title. Okay, so if I uh, say hello to Josh, it produces UI output. So we've just built a uh, web application with nothing but Python in a very, very short period of time. It's actually live on the web internet already. Uh, this is its private URL. This is like a Google Docs sharing link. So, you know, you can't guess it, but if I send it to you, you can access the app. Let's make it public. Uh, so I'm going to call this hello pywebconf.anvil.app. And now you could open your browser right now and go to hello pywebconf.anvil.app and this application is live. So we have just built and deployed a web application with nothing but Python in that little time. Now, of course, everything we've done so far is actually running in the web browser. <laughs> Even this Python code is getting compiled to JavaScript and executing there, and we'll talk later about how that's done. But any serious uh, application is going to need some server-side code as well. So for this, we have server modules. 
this is a Python module that runs on our servers. Uh, this is an ordinary Python module with an ordinary Python function. an F string. But what we can do is we can tag this function anvil.server.callable. And that says this function on the server is something I should be able to call from the browser. So if we go back to the browser, when the button gets clicked, as well as updating the UI, we can anvil.server.call that say hello function we've just defined. It wants a name parameter, so let's give it the text from that text box. And now if we run this, and say hello to Josh, you can see we've got some output in the log file. And that was the print statement running on the server driven from this UI we've built with nothing but Python. And now we're really in business because sure there's limits to what you can do here. You know, you can't really cross compile TensorFlow to JavaScript that practically, but this is a real Python interpreter, you can go to town. I want to connect to a database, import PsychoPG2. I want to do some machine learning, import some TensorFlow. I want to do some statistics, import SciPy, it's all there. In practice, the first thing everybody always asks is, so where's the database? Uh, so we actually built a database uh, in, say you having to spin one up yourself. It's the data table service, it's backed by Postgres, so you can stick uh, terabytes into this thing if you need to. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit less ambitious. I am just going to, uh, record all the people who enter their names into this app. So I've created a table. I'm going to add a column, a uh, string column uh, called name, and I'll add a date time column for when it was that the name was entered. And that's it. I've just built my database. This table is app tables.visitors. It's accessible from my code just like those buttons and text boxes were. So if I go into the server code, as well as printing that message into the logs, I can also take app tables.visitors, that, app, that table I just created, I can add a row to it. I can fill out the name column with its name that's been passed in. I'll fill out the when column with date time dot now. Let's make sure we import date time. Okay, and now if we run this, I enter Josh's name, I enter my name, and I go back to the database and I can see that that data has been recorded. So we've now built and deployed a database backed web application with nothing but Python in this shorter period of time. I, I could go on and on. There's an awful lot more to Anvil that I'm not showing you so far, but uh, I'm going to show you one more thing because it's going to be important in some of the technical discussions later. I'm going to show you how to take this data and display a table of previous visitors. So uh, first things first, we need to create somewhere on our page to display this data. So I'll put a headline here. I will label it previous. Answers. And then underneath it, uh, we can have a card. Uh, and on it, we will put a data grid. And this data grid will have two columns. It will have the name. I'll pull the name key out of the dictionary like object inside it. And uh, let's have a when insert, which is going to pull out the when key. And I do not need that third column. Okay, and we can now do things like you know, adjusting the widths and so on. Now inside this data grid is a repeating panel. And a repeating panel is uh, a component that has an items property. And you can set that items property to anything Python can iter over. And it will take this template and instantiate this template class once for everything uh, in that everything in that iterable object. So uh, we have somewhere to display it. Uh, we now just need to fetch that data. We need an iterable object. So we will write a server function that queries our database. So we make a callable function, def get visitors. Uh, and it's going to return at tables.visitors.search. Now we could you know, uh, narrow down this query, but by default, it'll return everything. So now we have that function. We can go into the code of our page. And this is the init method. So of course, it runs when we open. And when we open up, we want to set the, that items property of the repeating panel to the return value of that get visitors function on the server. So now if we run this, 
uh, as it loads, it will go ask the server and it will enter. Oh, there we go. There's that rush of people who uh, wanted to see their name on the big screen. We can see the contents of the database. Now that's quite neat. It's not as neat as it could be, of course, because you know these are kind of ugly. We're just calling stir on a date time, which isn't very pretty to look at. So let's go fix that. Uh, if we go back into the design, uh, what we want to do is edit this template. So instead of doing the default thing, which is to pick up the column from the data table and uh, and so the column from the data grid and look that up in this element and stir it, uh, I'm going to put a label in there and customize it. So I'm going to set up a data binding so that the text of this label is set to self.item. So item is an object that is a row from the visitors table. It's an element from that iterable that we've stuck into the items. And then I'm going to pull out the when column, which is a date time, and I'm going to call stir of time it, like a good Python stuff. All right, let's run this. And now, of course, uh, we have some nicely formatted dates. So that's a brief example. I could go much further, but uh, I hope I've given you a flavor of uh, how Anvil enables you to do things, how fast, and how we use Python objects everywhere. So I'm now going to uh, jump back in and talk a bit about how we actually do that. So, uh, keyboard focus. Okay. So I'm going to do, as promised, a technical dive into how this works under the hood. Uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is compiling Python to JavaScript, because that's a fairly major feature of Anvil. Uh, if we are uh, putting something into a web browser, then the client side code is going to have to be in JavaScript. And if we're writing Python, then we're going to have to translate it. Uh, so we use uh, the Sculpt Python to JavaScript uh, compiler for this. It's a very new project. Uh, if you, you can give it uh, a Python program or a Python statement, and it will produce a JavaScript statement that does roughly the same. You give it a Python function, it will give you, honestly, the ugliest JavaScript function you have ever seen, but it will have the same effect as that Python function. Uh, and this is great, but JavaScript, in its infinite wisdom, is a 100% uh, non-blocking language. And this presented a problem to us because you saw me in that demo. I was using a lot of things. A lot of the things that made that easy was the fact that I could do an Apple server call and use its return value immediately. We wanted blocking Python because so many Python API, APIs are idiomatically blocking. And so we wanted to do things like this. Now here's a, some, something you might write in Python, right? You're making a database query and synchronously using the result. Here is how you might end up doing that in JavaScript. I count one, two, three nested callbacks and lest you accuse me of cheating, I copied and pasted this from the first page of the Postgres JavaScript API documentation. And sure, you could use promises, you can use async await, but they're all, again, there are these magic leaky abstractions on top of a series of callbacks. And fundamentally, if you don't understand that this is a series of callbacks going on, you're going to come unstuck when you try to use it in an advanced way. The good news, however, is that we have a Python to JavaScript translator, which means that we stood a standard chance of converting uh, the simple thing into the thing JavaScript needs programmatically. So we git clone and get started. It turns out that Sculpt has a pretty classic compiler architecture based, not, not surprisingly, on CPython. Uh, so you feed it a string with your Python code in, it will then split it apart into tokens and parse trees, and then assemble, by the way, these uh, .js files, these are the source files within Sculpt if you want to follow along at home. Uh, and then it will assemble these into an abstract syntax tree, which is a tree of operations that we might find familiar in Python. So here, for example, we have an assignment. And on the left-hand side of this assignment is a variable name result. And on the right hand of the assignment is a function call. Uh, it's calling a function from the name f. And it's got a single parameter, which is the integer literal 42. And then what we have is a compiler that walks its way over this tree, spitting out JavaScript. 
And so it's pretty clearly this compiler that we're going to need to modify in order to uh, translate blocking Python into non-blocking JavaScript. Uh, so remember that Sculpt translates Python functions into JavaScript functions, and JavaScript functions have to return. They don't get a choice. So what we did was we invented a new return type. These functions could return to say, sure, I'm returning, but I'm not actually done yet. I'm just blocking. And uh, we call that a suspension. So what this call site ends up looking like is this. So we call the function, and then we take the return value and check whether it's a suspension. If it is a suspension, which is one of these special values, we then save everything in our half-executed function, wrap that up in a new suspension, and then return that instead. Uh, so here's how that works in practice. So here, for example, we have a button click handler, and then we are uh, doing a database fetch and carry on. So the call stack looks like this. Uh, we've called from the JavaScript runtime into the button click handler, into this get method, and that's talked to the database, and the database is blocked. Well, the get method looks at the return value of its function call and goes, oh, wait, that's the suspension. Better save all my local variables, save all my temporary, save where I am in the function, wrap that up in a new suspension that also wraps the original suspension and return that. And button one click does the same thing, saves all its locals, saves all its temporaries, wraps it up in suspension and returns that to the JavaScript runtime, which goes, okay, this Python code is blocked. And then a few milliseconds later, the database comes back and that promise resolves and uh, the runtime goes, okay, well, time to resume the suspension. And resuming a suspension, it's a method on the object, but it actually calls that button one click function, but it calls it in a special way with a special flag to indicate that I'm not calling you from scratch, I'm calling you to, to, to finish off this half finished execution that you've given me, here's the object. And what the generated code in button one click will do is it will restore all its local variables, restore all its temporaries, jump to the right point of the function and resume executing. Uh, and of course, uh, it will resume, sorry, resume its inner suspension, which in turn uh, jumps to the right point, restores all gets locals, restores all its temporaries and resumes executing in the database, which returns immediately and we're back into ordinary execution. And so that is how uh, we turn blocking Python into non-blocking JavaScript so you don't have to deal with those horrid APIs. Uh, again, check out sculpt.org. There's a lot going on on that project. I'm one of the maintainers. Uh, please do pitch in and help if you think that sounds like fun. Here's another thing that uh, was quite important in that uh, demo you saw. I was defining functions on the server and just calling them from the browser. And this is a darn sight easier than setting up REST endpoints and routing and all this stuff. So let's look a little bit into how that works. As a reminder, here's the syntax. So it's aml.server.call, we name the function. Of course, it's not actually, in our, it's not actually you know, loaded into the same interpreter, so we just give it a name. Um, but it's, it's a Python function call. We've got positional arguments, we've got keyword arguments, we've got retur uh, return values, it's blocking. We know how the blocking works, that's suspensions. What about transmitting the data? Well, we do RPC over WebSocket connection, uh, encoded as JSON, because that's sort of the obvious thing to do. But what about the stuff that's not JSON? Uh, you saw me, for example, throwing around uh, rows from the database or lazy iterators over database rows. And those are really important to be able to pass into and out of these server functions if you want to maintain a natural function call API. So our answer to this is to add a new data type that our RPC serializer understands. And, oh yes, sorry, this is just an example of um, what the API uh, should look like. So, you know, we, we can, this is an example of using, of the API we want, right? We want to be able to take a value from the database and just return it. And you saw, again, you saw me doing this in the demo. Uh, we can call, we, once we've got that object, we can call functions like a get item, right? That's, in, that's an implicit function call on line 18 there, uh, on the object we've just got. So the way we implement this is live objects. So a live object is an object that represents a server-side resource. 
So that object that was returned really is that row in the database. All its client side state is merely cache for performance reasons. Uh, it's, of course, it's got to be secure because just because I can call the get item method on this one database row doesn't mean I can get data from every row in the database. That, that sort of defeats the point. I'm in a browser, remember, I'm in an untrusted environment. So the rule we adopt is that possession is permission. Now, this is formally known as a capability architecture. The idea is that you only you can only call methods on an object if the server-side code, the trusted code, has returned it to you, has given it to you. And so this is how it works. Uh, every live object has an ID, in this case, you know, this row of this table, but it represents, you know, it represents which server-side object uh, is being, is being uh, bandied around here. It's got some methods, you can execute on it, obviously, and then it's got a set of permissions, which we'll get onto in a moment. As you return this from the server, what we do is we take a hash over this and we sign it with a key that only the Anvil runtime server knows. And so uh, when you call a method on this object from, from the browser, it will transmit this object and the signature back with it. And the server can check the signature and say, well, if this signature passed, I must have given you this object uh, because I'm the only one who knows this key. And so I will allow you to make this method call. And you can't tamper with it because that would break the signature. Here's the API that that produces. So uh, what, uh, here's a server function that you're, you're, we're searching for a record in a database. And uh, the thing we do is we check using our built-in user authentication system, which I don't have time to tell you about today. It's awesome. Check it out. Um, we check whether someone's logged in in this session. And then if they are, then we get a row from the database and return it. And so we only return that live object. We only give the client, the untrusted client code, we only give it that object with the signature that they can call methods on if uh, somebody is logged in. And so what that means is uh, the, the permissions check and the handing around of the data happen at the same time, which means it's much easier to keep them in sync and you don't end up with one of these classic web vulnerabilities, which is that the permissions checks ended up with different rules for the data transmission. We can get cleverer than that, though, because remember, we have that permission field as well. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, here is a simple example of how you might use that. Here's something more exciting. So here's a version of that. We want to allow the client code to write that database row. Why not? So we the the server-side code is almost the same. We check whether someone's logged in, but then we take the people table and we get a client-writable version of that, and we search for that. And what that means is that we're going to get a live object for that row that has client-writable permission on it. And so the client code, untrusted in the browser, can call set item on it and change that database row. And it's safe because it could only call that methods on that live object if it were given by trusted code that knew that signature. So <clears throat> we've now ended up securely in a point where we can update the database row from your button click handler. And you no longer have to pipe all of your operations through seven layers of stack in order to do anything. You can just do it right then and there with just a Python object. We can be even cleverer than that, actually. Uh, because data tables themselves are also live objects. So we can return a view on a table. So uh, here, walk, walking through this, so what we're doing is we are getting a subset of a table for the currently logged in user. So line 21, we get the currently logged in user. Then we check if there is someone logged in, we take at table.records, and then we get a client writable view on that table, but it's a restricted view. It's only applies to rows where the owner column matches the current user. And that restriction is encoded in the live object, is transmitted back to the client. And so the client can actually access it. It can use it like a data table. It can add rows to this table from client code, again, saving you a lot of plumbing. But it's safe because you can only do that if the trusted server-side code decided to give you that object. Possession is permission. The last piece of uh, 
technical insights I'm going to talk about here is autocompletion. And this is a subject dear to my heart. Again, you saw it in that demo um, where every, everywhere I was typing, it was suggesting attributes and names and column names and databases and so on. Uh, autocompletion is really, really important. Uh, it gives you discoverability. Uh, you can see what functions there are to call. You can see what attributes a particular object has without having to switch to the documentation every few seconds. It gives you speed because it's an awful lot easier to type two characters and hit the tab key uh, rather than uh, writing out every variable name in full. It gives you confidence that what you're doing is right. There are whole classes of bugs you can find and fix uh, without even hitting the run button because the autocompleter is gently informing you that no, that's not how that function name is spelt or that this thing you got was not the type, type you expected it to be. And for all of those reasons, it just feels good to use. Uh, now, I expect, to, for many of you, I'm preaching to the choir here, but I have to confess, uh, when we started Anvil, we thought we could get away with that autocompletion. We thought it was an optional feature. I'm here to tell you we were wrong. Autocomplete is an essential feature. And if you are not one of the enlightened using PyCharm or maybe VS Code with a Python code server, uh, if you're one of those Emacs and Vim's diehards, go for it. That's great. But if you take only one thing away from this entire talk, install Jedi as a plugin. Just, just try it. Uh, try it for a week, make me that promise, it will change your life. Autocomplete is really important. Unfortunately for Anvil, we couldn't use an off-the-shelf system like Jedi, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is that Anvil knows about more than just your code. It knows about your data table. It knows about uh, your server functions, and it knows about the components in your user interface. And sure, we could have jerry-rigged that into an off-the-shelf system, but uh, the other killer is that things like Jedi are expecting a file system, and Anvil's editor is running in the browser. And when you are writing code, there is just not enough time to get, for you, when you hit the tab key, to get from your browser to the server, uh, do your completions, and then come back with an answer. Uh, and if you don't believe me, try REPL.IT, which is honestly a really great code playground, but if you use its Python mode, they do the auto-completion on the server, and the auto-completion is awful. 200 milliseconds is just too long to wait. It completely throws me out of flow, and I expect it will for you too. So we had to implement our own, uh, and we did it in JavaScript, which would seem like quite daunting, except, of course, we have a, pipe, a Python to JavaScript compiler in JavaScript lying around the place, uh, so we could reuse bits from that. And in particular, we reused a thing you've already seen, which is the uh, AST generator. So what we do actually is when you hit the tab key, we take your code, we replace the position of your cursor with a random symbol, and then we feed it to the sculpt parser and AST generator. And this produces a tree of uh, everything in your code. And then we can walk over that tree and go, well, oh, that's an assigned statement. That means there must be a variable called x in scope and add it to our scope. And then when we hit the magic cursor symbol, uh, we can then offer autocompletions for everything that happens to be in scope at that moment. Of course, we can autocomplete an awful lot more than uh, just things that are, uh, just which variables are in scope. We can, uh, we're auto-completing, you know, the result of attribute lookups, the result of function calls, what you get if you iterate over the result of this function call, and uh, not just attributes, but uh, <coughs> items, you know, things in square brackets, so auto-completing uh, columns in databases is a big one for us. Uh, there's an awful lot you can do once you have this thing represented as an AST. It's not, of course, it's not just uh, the return values from functions you're interested in. It's not even just local functions you're interested in. We're interested in server functions, right? When we make this call on the client, we call this say hello function. We really want to be able to auto-complete those arguments as well as that return value. And so the way that we do this is that um, as we are walking the client side code for parsing it for auto-complete, um, we spot, oh wait, hey, this is a call to a server function called say hello, and this is, these are the types of its arguments. And so we can save that information, sock it away somewhere. And then when we are parsing the server module for autocomplete, we can spot, aha, we are now parsing a server function called say hello. I know 
what types this gets called with and from where, and I can pluck those, that information out, drop those types uh, into the scope, resolve them against you know, the, the formal parameters of this function, and then we know what type D is and we can autocomplete. We can autocomplete an awful lot about types, which actually ends up leading, leading to a fairly philosophical question about what exactly a type is. And you could say, yes, the type is what you get when you call the type function. It's the class of your Python object. And that's mostly true. But Python's actually a very dynamic language. You can add attributes dynamically to individual instances, uh, even sometimes two things with identical attributes. You might want to think of them as different types. Uh, our answer is actually to sort of forget about the formal type of the thing. Uh, we duck type our autocompleter. Uh, so as far as the advert autocompleter is concerned, these two dictionaries are two different objects with two different types. So obviously they share a lot of methods, but they are two different types with two different item mappings, which allows us to do autocompletion properties. So I've talked to you, I've shown you what Anvil looks like when it's in use. I've uh, walked you through how a few things under the hood work. If you are interested more in how it works under the hood, I have good news for you because the entire application framework I've been talking about this whole time is open source and has been since last month. Uh, so you can go dig in and find out. So the, the editor is a commercial product uh, with a free version. You're welcome to use, it's very powerful. Uh, but all of the technology I've just been talking about is part of this open source repository. So do check it out. The last thing that I'd like to talk about is the design philosophy, because you've seen it in practice, you've seen some of the things, some of the how, and I'd like to talk, just to finish, a little bit about the why. And there are two big principles that have informed us in designing Anvil the way we have. And the first important principle is that code is good. We are telling a computer what to do. And we've been telling computers what to do for approximately three quarters of a century by now, and in all of that time, we have yet to find a better way of doing it than writing text in a programming language. People do occasionally pop up and say, sure, well, web programming is too complicated. You should just like do everything with a flowchart and drag and drop everything. And that's almost always a false promise. One of two things is going to happen. Either that, that nice click and draggy flow, draggy flow charty system is not going to be able to do what you want at all and you'll be stuck. Or you're going to find yourself in Cthulhu's own flow chart, shaking your monitor, yelling, yelling, let me write the blasted for loop because you know that this thing could be done with a five line for loop in Python. So we let you write the five line for, line for loop in Python. Code is good. Gauge of the code, even in the UI designer. You remember when I was building that table of uh, the people who'd entered their names and all the dates and times when they had been entered? And I wanted to format those dates. I wasn't dragging some kind of noodly line from my database representation onto my web page, no. I wrote a Python expression. And because I was writing a Python expression, when I wanted to format that date, I could just pick up the standard library and use Spiro type. And that's what you get from having access to the code. So code is good, get me to the code. The second and final principle is to be accessible. And sure, if I, if I conducted a straw poll uh, among you right now and asked you what being accessible meant, uh, a lot of you would probably answer that, that, that being accessible means being simple enough for novices to use. And you'd be right. I mean, it's maybe a bit spicy, but I think it is a stain on our profession as web programmers that we have created the greatest application delivery platform on earth, the web. And then we set the bar at, you must know five programming languages and five to seven frameworks before you can ride this ride. That's embarrassing, frankly. So yes, the web should be simple enough for novices to program, and I make no bones about that. But that's not all. To be truly accessible, you also need to be powerful enough for seasoned professionals. 
And this is actually partially for the novice's benefit because you need, as a novice, you need space to grow your powers. If you're stuck in a playpen with something that's only ever going to be a toy, you're not going to grow. And you're also going to run into requirements that you can't fulfill. But it's also for the benefit of the seasoned professionals because, you know, just because I can write five different languages and I can use seven different frameworks doesn't mean that I want to. And it certainly doesn't mean that my manager wants to wait for me to do it. And so you might be thinking, well, that's all very well. Sure, everybody would love that and I would love a pony too. And honestly, I think the web has trained us to think that these two things are incompatible goals. And we should know better than that. We in particular should know better than that because we are all in this virtual room. Because the thing we have in common is the Python programming language. That programming language is the first thing an eight-year-old will learn in their first Raspberry Jam. And Python is the language that powers Instagram. And it's the language that DeepMind used to beat the human brain at Go for the first time in recorded history. It is possible to be simple enough for novices and powerful enough for seasoned professionals. We are sitting, all of us, on living proof. And it is only the garbage fire of modern web development that ever makes us doubt it. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Richard. That was fantastic. You are the king of uh, live demos. I'm a. Uh, you, sh you definitely showed that off last time. And again, like at any pie when people were like, "Oh," and they'd ask a question, you'd be like, "Of course." <laughs> you'd, you'd show it. Well, uh, yes, I, I don't, uh, maybe uh, the uh, folks in the uh, uh, in, in the after session uh, will ask me some questions, and I'll get to do that again. In oh, the meantime, definitely. do you have any questions for me before this session wraps up? Mm -hmm. So David asks, part of Python's power is the ecosystem of packages on PyPy. Is it possible to use them in Anvil? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure that... Uh, David, I mean, obviously, that's in the server, right? Because most of the packages on PyPy are going to be too complicated, or they're going to have file system dependencies, or they're going to have other reasons that you can't cross them, compile them to uh, run in the browser. But that's OK, because the server is just a function call away. And that's a real Python interpreter. So of course you can use all the Python skills. You know, you don't have to use our database. You can, you know, grab a database package off PyPy and use it. That's that's the point. That's Python. Right. David also asks, uh, I see that the server is written in Clojure and runs on the JVM. Why not Python? Uh, excellent question. Um, so this is okay. So this is a point where I might get slightly heretical for this audience. Python for us is a UI implementation decision. We chose Python because Python's values, the things that I was, you know, I wasn't just ragging, I mean, I was ragging on the web, but I wasn't just ragging on the web when I evoked PEP20 because Python's values are the values that are so sorely missing from the web. And so we chose Python as our implementation language, um, but we happened to pick up the tools that were closest to hand when we came to actually building this thing. And uh, I'm afraid I'm a long time Lisper as well. So uh, Clojure seems like a good balance. It's not in fact just in Clojure. Uh, the, uh, if, you'll dig, if you dig deeper into that, um, that repository, you'll find that like the API router that manages the requests uh, is all in JavaScript. Um, but all of the server side, sorry, is all, manages the requests is all in Clojure. The front end stuff is all in JavaScript, obviously. Um, and the stuff that actually manages how your server functions run is all in Python. So we're polyglots. Cool. Uh, Benjamin asks, uh, does WASM have any implications, implications for Anvil? Uh, so it's, it, it's a tempting target for Sculpt, really. Um, although actually, we've like uh, the Sculpt team, obviously, we've discussed this. Uh, the the thing that you do with a front end in Anvil in particular, most of the time is driving the browser's DOM. And actually WASM to, uh, to JavaScript is, is a slightly funky, weird bridge. And so we actually reckon that WASM for Sculpt is more likely to end up being used for, uh, for things like, um, uh, you know, maybe sort of, you know, it, 
if if we could ever run NumPy in the browser, that you know WASM will be how. So that would be that that would be we'd be much more likely to use it that way than to use WASM as a compilation target, simply because you spend most of your client side stuff driving the DOM. Awesome, thank you so much. I see there are a few more questions here. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time here on the live stream, but uh, you'll be able to join Meredith in the breakout session. Uh, I'll make sure I throw that link in the Slack. Um, right awesome, after this. I look forward to being there. I will have my screen share at the ready, challenge me. <laughs> thank you very yeah. much for having me. I hope you have a great rest of the conference.